And I've been taking care of business Doing tasks Taking care of business Wearing masks I've been taking care of business On the scale Taking care of business What the hell? What? Welcome one and all to another episode of Engage, where learning through play is the name of the game. I sincerely hope that all of you are staying as healthy and as safe as you possibly can in this dark winter. I'm really excited today because in this episode of Engage, we're calling a meeting to discuss Among Us. By this point, if you've not already heard of this game, chances are either you don't play video games that often, you haven't spent that much time on YouTube as of late, or you're fighting to keep your head above water while teaching in a pandemic. And holy guac, if you follow that hashtag on social media, you'll find so many stories of educators all across the country and the world making sacrifices as they try so very hard to help kids and teens navigate through this time of unprecedented crisis and uncertainty. We may have seen the end of 2020, but we've still got many difficult months ahead of us. So please, if you happen to know any educators out there, don't wait all the way until Teacher Appreciation Month to express your gratitude. Thank you so much to all the teachers out there, to all the students trying to make the very best out of an impossible situation and make the most out of every moment, and thank you of course to all the parents out there for your support. And speaking of support, if you'd like to support the future of this show, please subscribe, share this episode around, and check out our Patreon. Link in the description below. Now for those of you new to the crew of the Skeld, Among Us is a quick and dirty social deduction video game originally released for PC, iOS, and Android, in which 4 to 10 players take on the role of astronauts blasting off into space on a mysterious scientific research investigation. As part of the crew of the Skeld, you'll find yourself frantically running around the ship as you try your best to keep the rickety vessel intact through completing various tasks, but it won't be long before... <laughs> Now before we go any further, I have to pump the brakes here for a quick second and make it crystal clear that playing Among Us requires having a stable internet connection. This is the first game that we've explored here on Engage that has this as a hard and fast requirement and it surely won't be the last. If your classroom does not have access to a reliable Wi-Fi network, and believe me, I know that frustration all too well, don't despair. I'll have a few suggestions for comparable alternatives in the follow-up to this episode. If you are fortunate enough to be able to check that checkbox off, here's what else you need to know in order to get started. First, the game requires being installed on your available hardware. Among Us may have the aesthetic of an old school Newgrounds.com flash game from back in the day, but Among Us is not one of those games. The good news here is that Among Us is a free to play game on iOS and Android anyway, but you're gonna have to fork over two bucks a copy for an ad free experience. And since we're talking about leveraging this game in a classroom environment, that is gonna be something you will want to do, so you won't have to worry about the content of whatever ads happen to pop up, nor will you have to waste precious seconds of your class time waiting for the ads to play in between rounds. I can't speak to Android app deployment in schools, but as a former director of education, educational technology and innovation, I can tell you that if your school happens to be an Apple environment, you might be able to weasel an educational discount on that price tag. There's a certain threshold we have to cross in order to be able to gain educational pricing on a bulk app deployment, but this applies to any app. I would keep that little nugget of knowledge in your back pocket. Meanwhile, on PC, there is no free-to-play version with ads. The game's just five bucks a pop. Very simple, very easy. From my research for this episode, it did not appear as though neither Steam nor the Epic Game Store offer any sort of educational pricing option for bulk downloads of games through their services, but Epic Games in particular has been expressing interest in conferences as of late for helping educators out. So who knows? Maybe they'll start offering some educational pricing options soon. Once you have the game installed, let me remind you that Among Us is a game for 4 to 10 players. And obviously, most classes are going to have far more than just 10 students in them. So this is a game to facilitate in small groups, and I would recommend setting up groups of at least 8 students apiece in order to get the most out of this experience. Now, given the fact that Among Us was 2020's most downloaded mobile game, chances are going to be pretty good that your students are going to know where to take it from here. But 
for the benefit of anybody watching who has not played this game before, you have two options for being able to host a session of Among Us, local and online. To run a game locally, all players must be in the same physical location and be using the same Wi-Fi access point or Wi-Fi network. Now, obviously this is not an option during distance learning while teaching in a pandemic, but it's an option to keep in mind for years to come down the line when hopefully things will start to get back to normal again. To run a local game of Among Us, have one student per group volunteer to host the game session. For that student to become the game's host, all they need to do is hit local on the title screen and then create game. Once the meeting room has been launched, the rest of the group should then be able to hit local and see that game session under available games, and click or tap on that game session to join. While waiting for the rest of the group to join, the host can walk over to the little laptop in the game, click or tap customize, and click or tap game in order to access the game settings. This is where the host can select the map or where the game will take place, as well as select how many players there will be that will take on the role of the imposter. And I'd highly recommend with having your group start off with just one imposter at first. If instead you plan to run a game using Inner Sloth's global servers, the student volunteering to host the game will hit online and launch a private game. Please bear in mind when launching a game via this method that the host has to pick the map in which the game will take place and the number of imposters before the game starts. Once the host makes their selections, the meeting room will launch and the six digit code will be provided on screen. Players can now join this game by hitting online on their start menu and entering that code into where it says private. Now I personally have only ever played Among Us via the online option, so I cannot attest to how stable a locally hosted game is or whether there are any distinct advantages to hosting a game via the local method versus the online method. I imagine it's a perfectly viable option if everybody's in the same room together, but otherwise hosting a game via the online method is perfectly fine because it's secure in that players can only join your game if they have the six digit passcode. Now that we got the basic setup out of the way, let's turn our attention back to the rules and the mechanics of the game itself. Arguably the most well-renowned social deduction game of all time is Mafia, created in 1986 by Dmitry Davidoff and was later reskinned by Andrew Plotkin with a new werewolf theme. And I bring this up because the elevator pitch for Among Us is that it's basically Mafia or Werewolf, but with chores. When a game of Among Us begins, each player will find out whether they'll be taking on the role of a crewmate or one of the nefarious imposters. If you're a crewmate, sorry pal, you're stuck with the chores. And you'll find those chores on the left side of your screen where it says tasks. Fortunately, the game tells you where each one of these tasks is located and there is a map you can access for reference in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Thankfully, the design team at Intersloth also had the foresight to be kind enough here to new players and allow you to move around while having the map pulled up on screen so that you can find your bearings easily. It's actually quite amazing to have the ability to do that, as most other video games make you pause in order to look at the map to orient yourself in whatever world you're playing in. As far as player controls go, if you're playing on a mobile device, you have the option to toggle between using an on-screen joystick to move your character around or using touch-based controls. Meanwhile on PC, you can play with a keyboard and mouse, but there does not appear to be any native support for playing with a controller. But I'm sure somebody out there has probably figured out by now how to make the controls on that version of the game more flexible if desired using something like a Makey Makey. As you move around, you can easily identify the objects you can interact with as they'll have a faint white or yellow outline to them as you approach. And if you pull up your map, the exact locations of these interactables are shown by the yellow exclamation mark icons. The order in which you complete your tasks is entirely up to you. However, keep in mind that the first few tasks toward the top of your to-do list are known as common tasks. Common tasks are chores that other crewmates have also been assigned to complete, whereas the tasks toward the bottom of your list are tasks that are more likely to be assigned only to you. This is critically important intel that only you will have access to, and we'll talk about why that's so important later on. Now if all of the crewmates finish their tasks swiftly enough, the crewmates win the game, and all is well. But as the Scottish poet Robert Burns would say, the best laid schemes of my so men ganged off a gly. I, the thorn in the crewmate's side, is the imposter, which much like the alien in John Carpenter's sci-fi horror classic The Thing, is a devious little gremlin bent on destruction. 
If you're the imposter, your goal is to either kill the majority of the crewmates on board by your own hand, or to sabotage their equipment and bring the whole expedition to its knees. What makes averting these disasters tricky for the crewmates who are running around busy doing tasks and blissfully unaware at first of the monster that just joined their ranks, is that the imposter is a chameleon that has taken on their form and is able to mimic a crewmate's behavior almost perfectly. But I... There's the rub. Unlike the crewmates, the imposter does not have the ability to complete any tasks, so if you're playing as the imposter, you'll need to sneak around and make it look like you're busy while you're plotting your next move. TGIF, am I right, fellow crewmate? To tamper with the crewmate's equipment as the imposter, hit the sabotage button and you'll be presented with an interactive red map. You can slam doors shut and exploit critical points of failure in the crewmate's equipment without actually having to be in the room where said door or equipment is located. By the way, remember when I said earlier that the imposter lacks the ability to complete tasks? Well, the imposter does have the ability to fix whatever they just sabotaged. So if you're playing as a crewmate, you can't automatically assume that if you're rushing to fix something that just got broken, that whomever is rushing to meet you is coming to your aid out of the kindness of their heart. Thankfully for the crewmates, the imposter's ability to unleash total mayhem does have its constraints. After an imposter kills a crewmate or sabotages a piece of equipment, the imposter has to wait for a brief cooldown period. The imposter also has the ability to sneak around through vents or through tunnels if you're playing on the polis map, but because only the imposter has the ability to do this, it will be a dead giveaway of who you really are if you're caught popping in or out of one of these hidey holes, so look out. But what's the big deal if you're caught anyway, right? I mean, apparently none of these crewmates on this scientific mission into outer space thought it would be a good idea to bring weapons with them for self-defense. Where is it? I know, well, at least I've remembered my toothbrush this time, but where's my laser? I always forget to pack at least one thing every time. Hey, Yellow? Yeah? Have you seen my laser? No? Well, did you bring yours? Uh, yeah, I forgot. Of course you didn't. Maybe I left it in med bay or something. I hate it when I lose things. Well, the crewmates aren't completely defenseless. When summoned together by an emergency meeting, they do have the power to gang up on one player at a time and decide to chuck them in an airlock and eject them into outer space, dump them off the side of a plane, or hurl them into a pit of lava. Which might all be more gruesome ways to go than being struck down in one fell swoop by some gangly shape-shifting alien when you think about it. In order to call an emergency meeting, a crewmate has to make a mad dash back to the conference table and smash that big red emergency button just as hard as you should be smashing that subscribe button if you haven't already. The twist here, however, is that because the imposter is a near-perfect imitation of a crewmate, they also have the ability to smash that big red emergency button or self-report a murder that they themselves just committed, so watch out. On top of that, the imposter also has the ability to temporarily disable the emergency button when they tamper with certain equipment. And that is all you need to know in order to facilitate games of Among Us. But why even play Among Us in school in the first place? Isn't it just some fun little party game? Well, yes, it is a fun little party game, but there's so much you could do with it. Let's start at the heart, the emergency meeting. Under the crunch of a tight time limit, every emergency meeting in Among Us is a rapid-fire exercise in critical thinking and communication skills. As soon as players are thrust into an emergency meeting, they are faced with multiple snap decisions they have to make on the fly. For instance, do I chime in first, or do I listen first to what others have to say? If I did jump in first, do I ask questions to gather more information, or do I vouch for somebody else's credibility? If I didn't jump in right away, what do I do with that information that I hear? Do I react to what the other players are saying, or do I hold back and wait until I have more information? That's right, kids. Among Us is a perfect allegory for conversations about the news on social media. I'm only half joking here because all of the questions that players ask themselves while playing Among Us are the very same questions that we should all be asking ourselves when evaluating the reliability and validity of information presented to us in any form of media, really. 
The kicker here is that when you're strapped into one of those emergency meetings in Among Us, you don't get the time to dig around for more evidence to support whatever arguments are being made. You have to make that judgment call right then and there whether to vote somebody off the island. But unless you saw the imposter wreak havoc with your own eyes, how could you possibly make that call? Well, you have to. What is going on? Oh. Good. Oof. You got this? Everything is fine. I got here just in time. Thanks, buddy. I owe you one. Look, I tried to get here as soon as I could myself, but these doors just keep slamming in my face. I don't know what's going on, but I got so many other tasks I gotta take care of, so thank you. Uh, by the way, have you seen Yellow around? Sorry. I've been busy with... tasks. Cool, cool, cool. Look, I got so many other tasks to take care of. Uh, thank you. I'll see you later. Thank you. Your call is important to us. Someone will be with you. Momentarily. <sighs> okay, what was I saying earlier? Oh, right. You have to read the room and suss out context clues and make inferences based upon the observations you remember from earlier. Ha <laughs> ha. That was clever. Suss out information. Ha <laughs> ha ha. I appreciate your pun. Uh, thanks, I think. Are you here to take out the trash? Uh, yes, of course. That is what I am here to do. I am here to take out the trash. Thanks, bud. I really appreciate it. So what context clues can one observe? So what context clues can one observe when playing as a crewmate in Among Us? Well, remember when we were going over the basics of how Among Us is played and we talked about how each crewmate has to complete a certain amount of tasks? Remember how we took note that the chores closer to the top half of your to-do list are common tasks? These are the chores that other crewmates might be assigned to complete too. That also means that tasks toward the bottom half of your to-do list are more likely to be a tasks only assigned to you. So that's context clue number one. If you see another player dashing over to do a task that you know only you are supposed to be doing, that is going to be something that's highly suspicious. Or as experienced Among Us players would say, that's pretty sus. Another context clue your powers of observation might capture is what the game calls a visual task. Now, if you're brand new to the game, you might be thinking, dude, what are you talking about? All of the tasks are visual. I have to look at what I'm doing for all of them. What do you mean? What the game means by visual task is that there are certain tasks on each map that when a crewmate is actively engaged in completing one of those tasks, there is a special animation that's triggered that the other crewmates can see. Because the imposter cannot complete tasks, this can serve as evidence to corroborate alibis of other players that they claim to have when you're in an emergency meeting. Another context clue to consult is your dear old map. Play Among Us enough times and you'll start to internalize where to go in order to complete X task, plus you'll start to become aware of where the vents and those tunnels are that that nasty imposter uses, so later you can make inferences if you start seeing somebody pull some disappearing act. So now we've reflected on what evidence you can bring with you to the table when you're rushed into one of those emergency meetings. But again, unlike in a case of a science lab report or a persuasive essay, you don't get the opportunity here to show everyone your data or the bibliography of all that amazing research you spent all kinds of time gathering. Everything in Among Us relies purely on oral argument. So what do you do here? Well, here's where we have to flex those communication literacy skills. The big question you get to marinate on here is what makes for a genuinely convincing persuasive argument? Your typical English language arts curriculum will regale you of the virtues here of the five paragraph essay, but we ain't got time for that. When I used to teach English language arts, I know that the very first thing that my students would have on their minds is to ask, why? Why are we spending time learning this? Nobody's ever written five paragraph essays in real life. Nobody's ever been convinced by one in real life. So why are we wasting our time? And the truth is, you're partly right. Five paragraph essays alone don't cut the mustard in terms of transforming people's minds and getting them to think differently about an issue that you care about and getting off their butts to take action. So why do we keep teaching it? The reality is that the five paragraph essay is meant to just be a basic framework for guiding students on developing structure for their written expression. It's not supposed to be the be-all end-all, however. The real problem is that most of the time teachers don't get the chance to move past the basics because the basics are what standardized testing demands. 
And that's a subject to rant on for another soapbox moment for another time. I said another time. The fact of the matter is, we as humans are not strictly governed by logic or by the merits of a thoroughly researched lab report or persuasive essay. We have emotions too, and sometimes our emotional response to an event can override or take precedence over any sort of logical reasoning. Here's where Among Us provides us with the perfect jumping off point for all kinds of literary and historical and even social emotional learning curricular connections. Honestly, the first time I played Among Us, I couldn't help but think of how it could be a vehicle for studying complex characters in literature, particularly those who are well known for being manipulative and having ulterior motives behind their seemingly benign actions, such as Iago from Shakespeare's Othello. I'm sure he'd be a little too good at playing this game. You can also use Among Us as a launch pad into discussions and reflections on sensationalism in journalism media that we consume, not to mention the perils of propaganda and gaslighting and scapegoating throughout history. As an example of what you could do along these lines, after you've broken students into groups and they've experienced Among Us a couple of times and they've reflected on that experience, then have them break into groups and have one group play the game and another group shadow that group and quietly observe their behavior during the game. Ask them to make observations about things such as, is the player playing as the imposter using any particular tactic or strategy to deflect attention away from themselves while casting suspicion on other players? Is there any particular player that everybody seems to be listening to the most time and time again? And if so, why is that? How are they successful at getting people to listen to them and believe them? Is it because they're using any sort of argument based on evidence, or are they just the loudest person in the room? And how many players actively engage in the meetings in the first place? How many players speak up or how many players sit back? Does this behavior stay consistent throughout the game? And if you end up with a silent majority here, this provides a path toward discussing the perils of the bystander effect. There's also certainly something to be said for the exercise of comparing and contrasting how players interact with each other when they're in person, or at least in some sort of video chat or some method where they can at least hear each other's voices, versus only being allowed to use the in-game chat. If you can, have students emulate both of these experiences and ask them to observe any changes in player behavior. For instance, are there any players who chime in more frequently on the text chat than they did when they were face-to-face -face or in video chat? And if so, why do you think that is? And is there any noticeable difference in the quality or the depth of debates had in those emergency meetings between the two? And if there was, why the change? Is it just a matter of texting versus talking? Or is there something more to it than that? Spoiler alert, there's more to it than that. And then to expand upon this even further, you can pair this with digging into Katie Salen Tekkenbass's Raising Good Gamers initiative, which is seeking to bring together researchers and game developers and educators and policymakers and youth experts in the effort to make online gaming communities more youth-friendly and inclusive. And you can point to the New York Times Lesson of the Day featuring Chrissy Lawler as an example of this in action, as she had asked her students to investigate how Among Us is one of many games that has been leveraged as a positive platform for community building and social emotional support. I'd also strongly recommend giving high school English teacher and esports EDU coach Angelique Giannis a listen on Jim O'Hagan's Academy of Esports podcast, as she speaks to how Among Us reinvigorated the spirits of her students plagued by Zoom fatigue during the pandemic and got them excited to learn about crafting persuasive speeches. Oh, and there's no way that any social studies or civics or contemporary democracy class should miss out on the opportunity to dig into the immense impact that Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez had when she decided to leverage Twitch and Among Us together in an unprecedented effort to engage the video gaming community to get out the vote and talk about what effect could that have on civic engagement in the future. I'm telling you guys, there's so much you can do with this game. And if that wasn't enough, if you want to have your students really test their powers of observation and persuasion, have them crank up the difficulty in the game settings by turning visual tasks off, eject confirmations off, and turning anonymous voting on. 
That might sound like a bit of overkill, but when you think about it, that level of difficulty in Among Us is even more evocative of how we have to deal with information that we are bombarded with every single day, especially on the internet. You see, one of the best strategies that we have available to us in order to evaluate the validity and reliability of information that we encounter is to take that information and trace it back to its source so that we can vet the author for their level of expertise on the issue that they're talking about or vet whatever bias they might have. But it's really hard to do that with memes that fly around all over the place, especially when they're trying to sp spread all kinds of disinformation. But we can still cross-check their claims against those of well-known experts in the field and their well-documented research. Exercising those critical thinking skills and exercising discretion takes a lot more effort and a lot of mental energy than it does to just click share or retweet. But if we don't put in that effort, well, we're just gonna end up ejecting innocent crewmates all over the place. Hey, I'm filming over here. <clears throat> oh, hello, fellow crewmates. I was just fixing electrical. Which is where I found Dark Blue's body, right by the front door. Yeah, I was with Red the whole time. Well then, you got anything to say for yourself, Orange? Red sauce. Uh oh. Thanks for watching! This educational program is made possible by the support of our generous Patreon patrons. If you're interested in supporting our ongoing mission of making game-based learning of all kinds more accessible to educators everywhere, check us out at patreon.com slash engage show. All resources cited in this episode along with links to all music used with permission can be found in the description below. I'm Jeremy, and this has been Engage, where learning through play is the name of the game. We'll see you next time.